Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Heart Health with Michelle. I have again, Dr. Brian Lima, and today we're going to talk about heart failure and cardiac cachexia. Before I do, I would love for him to introduce himself. Um, he is a heart transplant surgeon, heart failure expert, and the author of Heart to Beat. Um, I'm so excited that you're back again. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Michelle. It's really a pleasure to be back again. Um, I love this topic. So uh, just a, a brief word about me. Um, I'm a cardiac surgeon. I've uh, been in practice for uh, 10 years. Uh, I specialize in heart failure and uh, trained at the Cleveland Clinic uh, and at Duke. And now I'm the director of heart uh, transplant and mechanical circulatory support for Medical City uh, here in Dallas. And uh, love this topic and hope we really get uh, down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> Yeah. So for those who don't know, what is cardiac cachexia? Let's just start right there. So uh, there's a lot of analogies between heart failure and cancer. So uh, many people are familiar probably with seeing uh, or hearing about cancer patients that get cachexia. Cachexia is just a wasting away, kind of losing weight, uh, muscle wasting, uh, things like that, that can accompany a disease like cancer. And it can also uh, and we see this accompany a chronic uh, disease like heart failure, where uh, your body is just totally put to the limit of trying to combat this illness. And in doing so consumes uh, a lot of its muscular mass uh, in the process. And so much like you hear, oh, you know, I lost 50 pounds without, you know, intending to, and that's an ominous sort of sign when we hear that and there's a cancer potential uh, at play. Same for us in the heart failure world. If we hear that someone's lost a bunch of weight uh, and they look, uh, especially, you know, our nutritionists, our dietitians, when they weigh in and perform that analysis for us can often tease out uh, some cachexia or malnutrition, even when it doesn't even look like it. Um, and so we see this a lot and it's, it's a problem that is totally flying under the radar. Definitely. Um, when do you most of the time see it? Is this only seen in advanced heart failure? Have you seen it show up early? When does it usually show up in terms of the heart failure connection? In my experience, it's something that happens more uh, when we start getting into the advanced uh, phase of heart failure. At least, you know, I'm partially biased because that's uh, when I get usually involved. Uh, but it's pretty, it could be very impressive. Uh, it, it, it mirrors a lot of what we hear and see in cancer. Uh, we, we, we're talking tremendous amounts of weight loss that could happen, uh, bad weight loss, meaning, you know, you didn't, they didn't want to lose weight, but they're, they just did. <laughs> um, sometimes it's because, you know, the heart can't pump enough, enough blood to the intestine. So you don't, you know, you can't digest well, or sometimes, it, it, it's uncomfortable to eat food because you get barely um, a lot of abdominal cramps or you, your body just is shutting down. It's not able to process things because it's running low on fuel. It's not getting enough blood flow. Yeah. And I think that's super important what you mentioned. So we take for granted what our heart does and that without it, we can't really do any functionality of anything in our body. So a lot of the times the gastrointestinal part is very connected and it happens more frequently than anything else. Right. So think about, you know, it can't digest food, but a, if you're not eating enough or you're not eating nutrient dense foods, it's going to lead to nutrient deficiencies, which is also going to make your heart have to overwork as well. I mean, one of the biggest things that's connected heart failure and cachexia from a nutritional standpoint is iron deficiency anemia. Um, it's also, we've seen vitamin D folate, vitamin C deficiencies. And it's primarily because like you mentioned, if blood isn't going to your GI tract to be able to process this food effectively, your body, you can't utilize those nutrients. And so that also can lead to it as well. Um, what about the fluid component to cardiac cachexia. Do you usually see individuals who have a lot of fluid that, that combine? Cause it's also hard to tell, right? You're that cardiac cachexia, you're losing weight, but you might also be gaining fluid. And so a lot of times, especially if you're not, um, you know, underweight or not borderline underweight, sometimes it might not be so easy to see. So how do you differentiate fluid loss, fluid gain with muscle depletion. Um, I think that's a big thing that's hard to see also. So 
I'd like to dive in a little bit into that too. Sure. And so that's a all the more reason why it's so important uh, for folks that have been told they have heart failure or advanced heart failure to see a, a heart failure specialist so that they can get evaluated by the whole team, which in always will include a, a dietitian, a nutrition expert. And part of that assessment involves figuring out just what you said, okay, how much, how fluid overloaded is this person? Because that's sort of the classic, man, if, you know, the heart can't pump enough blood forward, so things are backing up. Fluid is building up in the lungs, fluid is building up in the tissues, you can get swollen abdomen, swollen legs. Um, and how do we know how much excess fluid there is? And it can often mask these weight changes that occur. So maybe someone hasn't lost weight per se on the scale that they can say, yeah, I've lost 20 pounds or 30 pounds. What could have happened is they've maintained their same body weight roughly, but they've lost a lot of muscle mass and things like that. And now that fluid that's building up in the body is leading to sort of an evening out. So one of the things that we do is a right heart catheterization. It's basically our main diagnostic test that it directly measures the pressures inside the heart, which tell us exactly how hydrated or not you are, meaning how much excess fluid is circulating uh, in the vein system, meaning that because the heart can't beat forward, it's accumulating in the venous system. So based on that number, we know, wow, this person's really fluid overloaded. And we can then get them down to their quote dry weight by administering medications like diuretics or even helping the heart beat stronger with adrenaline medicine to try to get rid of that excess fluid. And then once you get down to your dry weight, which we all know by again, measuring those numbers, those pressures, then we can kind of get a sense of, wow, you know, your dry weight is X and when you didn't have heart failure, you were probably heavier than that because what we were now uncovering is you really lost a lot of muscle mass and, and have cachexia. Yeah. I mean, I see a lot of individuals who come to me who on the BMI scale are in the obese category and they go, you know, they have shortness of breath, they're fatigued, they go to the hospital and I, people tell me they got 40 liters removed. And because they were obese, most people just like, you know, didn't really think of it, but she's like, I knew something was wrong. And I had to be really an advocate for myself to make sure that people realize, like, I know my body and this is not what is normal for me. I mean, it's usually a progressive in terms of 40 liters doesn't happen overnight. It kind of happens over time. So sometimes it still could be hard to assess, but we need to make sure we're addressing that dry weight and understanding, are you losing muscle mass? Because the cardiac cachexia, we need, like, we need to address it. So if somebody has cardiac cachexia, what, what is the standard treatment? What can we do to help them gain more muscle, to help them gain more strength? Because we know that it really decreases quality of life if we don't address it and also prognosis. Right. And that's why it's so key uh, to have uh, someone like yourself on our team whenever we are um, tasked with having to evaluate someone that's been referred for heart failure. So it's, you know, within your purview of expertise, much better than mine to sort of how, help determine, okay, what can we do to help optimize this person's nutritional status? Because in many instances, we're thinking about, gee, you know, we've gotten to the point now where we're really thinking about having to go as far as a heart transplant or, or a surgery to implant a heart pump. Well, I want to get that person as tuned up and as in tip top shape kind of get them ready for the big game. It's kind of what I say. And well, if they're really cachectic and weak, I want to try to get that better as best as I can get it. And so that often will center around the nutritional plan, uh, supplements, what diet, um, exercise, rehab, uh, you know, cardiac rehab, things like that. anything and everything that we can do to get them as nutritionally optimized as we can. Because if they're not, then the chances of something going wrong with the surgery, uh, poor wound healing and recovery afterwards, uh, there's study after study after study that basically documents the improved outcomes we can uh, affect if we have optimized nutrition the best we can. 
Oh, 100%. I think it also is a struggle point because most people don't have a big appetite when they're in cardiac cachexia and it's a lot of labor to chew their food. It just exhausts them very easily. Um, so a lot of it is being strategic and what are we eating when we are eating or how, you know, the smaller frequent meals, the things that are going to be palatable, but also give us all the nutrients that we need is going to be helpful. And every person's different, which is why personalized medicine is so important. Important. But, um, you know, just simply saying you need to go on a heart healthy diet, there's a lot of things that are there that make it a little bit challenging because of the advancement of heart failure that's also coupled with it. Um, so I think that's a super important. And like you mentioned, if you're going into a cardiac surgery of any kind and you're not nutritionally optimized and you're not looking at your whole lifestyle being optimized, your recovery is going to be that much harder. Wound healing is going to be that much harder. And also just the way you feel afterwards is going to be so much different. So we need to optimize before and after in order to look at the whole picture. Um, but I think a big part of this whole conversation is that cardiac cachexia exists and we need to make sure that if you were diagnosed with heart failure, that you're looking at the difference between your dry weight and your actual weight, looking at, you know, that fluid status, ensuring that if you are losing muscle, that we're addressing it sooner rather than later, because the more advanced you you are in cardiac cachexia, the harder it is to rebound or for, or so to speak, to get to a better, you know, state because your body now has to build up so much more muscle mass. It has to work so much harder. And, you know, we have to go slow in the way because we can't put too much pressure on the heart either. And so, you know, there's that, that harder aspect when it's more and more advanced. So I, I like having this conversation because Anywhere that you are in your journey, you can be proactive. You can seek seek professionals like you who specialize in heart failure and, you know, specialized dietitians. And if you're a smoker, smoking cessation, all the specialists that you need to see, um, no matter what stage you are, but to give this information is important because I hope it reaches also caregivers and people who know somebody with heart failure who may need an outside perspective. Oh, wow. My mom didn't look like this a month ago. She's looking like she's losing muscle mass because a lot of times people are like, eh, it's just old age. It's okay. I'm fine. And they need an outside support system to identify, Hey, something's going wrong. Let's just look into it in right. order to actually catch it early because earlier intervention in all aspects of heart disease is going to be where we are able to effectively prevent future complications, but anywhere that we are, we want to take action in all aspects. So I think that's important. Right. I mean, and, and not to sort of uh, uh, overuse the analogy, but, you know, cancer. So if you if you catch a cancer, detect the cancer really early, well, then it's an easy cure, right? Then it's, uh, okay, great. It's so wonderful. We found this early. We can remove it, let's say, and we don't have to do any chemo, any radiation. You're done. And chances are it won't recur. Contrast that with waiting, right? Or you didn't know you had cancer and then you finally comes to clinical attention. And unfortunately it's advanced cancer. Now it's spread. It's not a simple cure. Now we're talking, well, uh, we can try removing it. We're not sure if we can. And then I think we're still going to have to probably do chemo and radiation and all these other things. And we still may not be able to cure it. And we're going to have to really get surveilled for the rest of your life and have scans and things like that. This is what's happening in heart failure. It's basically saying, well, you have heart failure, but you know, you look pretty good right now. You're, you know, you have good vital signs. We'll just kind of watch and see how things go. That would never fly in cancer, right? We would all think that's crazy. Like, what do you mean? You, you just told me I had cancer. Aren't you going to, shouldn't I be seeing a specialist? I mean, let's get this thing fixed now. I don't want it. I don't want to die from this. That's what really should be happening in heart failure. And it's not. And we need to change that because it, it, it is really a travesty. I think, and, and, and I'm not exaggerating. And I think, I think you and I are on the same page with that. That's oh, it. I completely agree. Um, I think a part of it is that people are just unaware of the effects of heart failure or that, you know, everyone thinks it won't happen to them or, oh, it's okay. I'll be fine tomorrow. And they don't realize, well, you can take action today and then prevent complications tomorrow. So why are we waiting? Um, you can always do something and, you know, being active also changes your mindset on the prognosis. It helps you feel more in control versus just 
passively watching because passively watching in any aspect is not going to help. We right. want to make sure that you are, we're, you're staying out of the OR. You're staying alive and that cardiovascular disease is not negatively affecting your quality of life. And so we need to be more proactive and we need to seek out these specialists because you would never, like you mentioned, if you have a if you have, God forbid, cancer of a certain kind, you're going to go to the specialist in that cancer. But in cardiovascular disease, a lot of the times like, okay, well, my internist did, is a cardiology, does cardiology also. And while they're great, sometimes you need that extra care, especially if you were diagnosed with heart failure. And I say this all the time. I see people who have LDL levels in the 200s. And I'm like, you need to see a clinical lipidologist and see if you have familiar hypercholesterolemia. An internist doesn't have that specialty and that knowledge. And a lot of people just didn't even know that existed. And so with heart failure, there's specialists within it that we need to go. It's kind of like AFib. If you have atrial fibrillation, you need to go see an electrophysiologist. You can't just see your internist because we need to make sure we're looking at all aspects. And I think that, that we need to be more proactive. We need to be asking questions and we need to be looking at all aspects of health from medical management to you know lifestyle, to nutrition, to physical movement, to stress management, sleep, all of it matters no matter where we are in the heart disease condition and spectrum. Um, and I think it's so important for us to be alert and be talkative and explain things that, you know, that we feel because people can come to your clinic and if they don't tell you, Hey, my mom looks like she lost 20 pounds or, you know, we, we can't guess we don't doctors can do so much from your knowledge. So I always encourage people tell the doctor, the story, tell them what you're seeing, because that helps them be really good at their job because they can't read your mind. And so I want everyone to really be more proactive um, so that you're really protecting your heart. Right. And it goes back to, you know, medicine is advancing exponentially, right? Whether it's uh, advanced techniques in diagnosing, uh, new medications, new therapies, new surgeries, new devices. And I would argue, of course, I'm biased that in the cardiovascular realm, in the heart failure realm, that, that advancement is happening so quickly. So that just like, again, if you see a, a physician and they tell you you have cancer, well, you may, you, you would probably insist on being seen by a specialist because they may have access to the latest chemotherapy drugs, the latest uh, access to trials, ongoing and experimental drugs, whatever that may be, new advances and techniques for detection. Same applies for heart failure. We have testing that we could do, devices that we can implant, medications that we could use, even all the way up to new mechanical heart pumps that work almost as well as a heart transplant. All of these things are at our disposal, but it only can help if you get to us soon enough, right? And so I think it's all the more reason to err on the side of earlier rather than later. Early identification, better results. That applies to everything in medicine. And it's definitely no exception here with heart failure. I love it. So, so important. Thank you so much for coming on my YouTube channel. I am so glad that we were able to talk about these important topics. Um, everyone, please follow Dr. Lima on Instagram I'm at Brian Lima MD and check out his book, Heart to Beat. Thank you so much for being here. And I appreciate all that you do. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.